Team New Zealand retaining the cup meant, for the first time in 17 years, we'd have continuity in the boat sailed. So why are there all these different types of boat and why do they even exist? What's gone wrong? Frustrated, confused? Don't worry, this video will help. frustration and I can feel you typing in the comments already. It's a waste of money, over-regulation, bring back the 12 meters, bring back the J-class. But I actually truly believe that these different types of boats and the roles they will play sets a fascinating design strategy and with a bit of understanding we could all be richer for it. Well likely more boats makes most people less rich but seeing cool boats is good for the soul so that's enriching isn't it? Anyway the good news is you've landed in the perfect place if you want to understand what these boats are, why there's so many of them, and exactly what makes this design race so fascinating to follow. First, story time. The America's Cup is a winner stays on format, and the winner and the challenger get to set the format of the next cup. Team New Zealand won the last cup in Auckland, and Ineos were the first challenger. So despite uncertainty around the venue, this made the next matchup the first time that a class would reappear in back-to-back -back cups for 17 years. This is great news for the cup, it's great news for the fans. We finally got continuity, the AC75 back. After saying all that, why am I releasing a video explaining why there's three different types of America's Cups yacht if they just agreed to use the same one? Well, if you're confused, you're not in the minority and the good news is you're in the right place. I'm here to give you the lowdown on what these boats are and why once you get to know the purpose they could make this the most fascinating AC design race in history. So starting with the AC75, returning for Barcelona 2024 is the America's Cup 75 foot class in its second rule version and this is what will be raced in the Challenger series and the Cup match itself. So if you've seen an AC75 on its debut in Auckland in 21, then this version will look visibly the same thing. It's a 75 foot monohull that flies using a pair of lifting wings um, set away from the hull to create impressive leverage and harness incredible amount of power in the dual skin mainsails. The concept had its naysayers. It does look to defy physics, but the racing at the last AC was fantastic and it's converted a lot of people. Watching the sailing, probably the most apparent change with the new version is that there are eight crew rather than 10 and the power plant will be using um, cyclores rather than hand grinders. In terms of performance though, the real changes with the latest version, the 75, is an increase in foil span from four to four and a half meters and a reduction in all up weight from 7,800 and something to 6,900 kg. This means less writing moment, but also left boat to lift and more wing to lift it with. So in theory, that means earlier takeoffs and a lower coefficient of lift on those foils. So maybe faster foils. On top of this, there are some design changes which are less obvious. So they've removed the bow sprits and the and the lines for them after the abandonment of what were redundant code zeros in the last cup. We never saw them. They've also allowed self-tacking jibs with no need for loading and unloading winches. And there's plenty more too, but for the purposes of this video, that's enough. Because what I find really fascinating about this rule and these boats, and it goes some way to explain why there's so many boats, is actually what you're not allowed to build. So you're only allowed to build one hull. So that means essentially a billion dollar game of rock, paper, scissors is happening. Every team will be battling to be the last to reveal their hand. Uh, kind of mixing metaphors there, but in terms of hull, there is no reacting to other teams. You've got one shot of it, so your modelling has to be spot on, 
based on the best data you can get and then just hope you got it right. And for this reason, we likely won't see any class legal AC75s until 2024. But only allowing one new AC75 would give a massive advantage to all the teams who are returning who have two AC75s from the last cup, which they could instantly start modifying. What they needed was a way to reduce the usefulness of those first boats so that the teams who had them would be prepared to sell them. And that's a tricky line to tow. So hence the Legacy 75s. As the name suggests, it's an America's Cup 75 foot yacht that's a legacy from the V1 rule used in Auckland. Any equipment measured for AC36 can be used as legacy equipment and now crucially to limit the value of these boats which are all owned by existing teams there need to be some restrictions on how much you can update and how much you can use them. So foil wings and flaps can't be changed at all, the lower hull surface can't be changed at all. So basically if you use a legacy AC75 you're stuck with all the old hydrodynamic package and you can't put any of your new wings, flaps, um, rudders, anything like that on the new boat. But the pros of using a 75 or legacy AC75 is that they already exist, there's no lead time to building one, you just got a bit of commissioning and you can test crew layouts and positions that mimic your ultimate race boat for the cup. But there are some downsides, we kind of touched on it. You can't test any new foil shapes um, and also these are race boats, they may not be censored up in the same way that you'd like a test boat to. Finally, sailing with a full crew is expensive. A Lingi are on the program with a Legacy AC75, they port T Ahi. American Magic are using Patriot. Ineos actually got rid of their boat, so they won't be using a Legacy AC75. And we're not really aware whether Luna Rossa or um, Emirates Team New Zealand are planning to use theirs or not. That kind of leads us into the next category, LEQ12 and AC40s. This is where things get a little bit more confusing, but bear with us because there is some method in the madness. Let's go with the LEQ12. 12 first and that stands for less or equal to 12 meters. Why this is named in metric when all the other cut boats are named in feet, I don't know, that's just the way it is. Anyway, in the last cup the teams were allowed to build test platforms, again under 12 meters, I think, um, but the rules are very open and there's really no restriction. Um, the only thing they put in this cup is the number of key components one of which is the hull surface, so you're effectively limited to one hull. You could kind of view the LEQ12 as an alternative or an additional test platform to using a legacy AC75. Some of the pros are that you're not tied to any class rule, so there's little restriction in terms of shape and the tech you can put on the boat. And it's great practice actually going through the process of putting a boat together, your own test boat, manufacturing it yourself. But there are cons. First of all is that you have to make your own boat, so that takes time and resource. And there are restrictions on the key components and those restrictions aren't very kind. So you're very limited to the amount of different bits of kit you can test. And crucially, you're testing at scale, so how transferable the data is, not sure. Both Ineos and Luna Rossa have constructed their own LEQ12s, but there is another way of getting an LEQ12. AC40s, they are defined as an LEQ12. AC40 is America's Cup 40-foot racing boat, crewed by four people. It's manufacturer supplied, one design, and... I think basically everyone realised in the last cup how problematic shipping 75 foot boats around the world is and seeing how cool the test mules were seemed like a good idea to make a test mule one design um, that could be used for the Women's America's Cup, Youth Cup and preliminary regattas. Every team has to buy a one design AC40 as part of their entry and the rules only allow certain numbers of LEQ12 test components 
but there is an exception for AC40 class supplied parts mounted on an AC40 hull. So it's basically a free for all. You can have as many of these as you want. Now, crucially, the way this is written, you're allowed to put parts from your quota on your AC40 from your LEQ12 pro quota. But if you put one design parts on a non class legal LEQ12 hull, then that counts. So um, pros, you've got a ready to ready built uh, test platform. And if you run two of them, you've got redundancy in parts, all of which can be switched over. The cons of the 40s is you're relying completely on Team New Zealand's build program. They designed, they're helping the manufacturer through McConaughey's. And you don't get any experience of actually building these boats. You're kind of filling Team New Zealand with experience and money. The key take home points are we've got a really interesting like decision pathways, kind of horses for courses, and we won't know the results of which choices were best until, well, probably Barcelona 24. I'm really excited to see how the different team strategies play out over the next year. Hopefully you'll uh, join us all along for the ride.